Hey atheists, what are some features of the atheist cultural canon? Here are some examples I've come up with. We don't share a culture, and if we're honest, we don't share values either. There's a niche community of millennial atheists who know about the Four Horsemen and the YouTubers, but that's just a niche fandom. Atheists don't share a culture. A very common sentiment among atheists in the English-speaking world. So much so that I actually predicted this response in my original thread. In before, atheism has no culture, for it is a single position that anyone with common sense inevitably adopts. It's almost like the first rule of atheist culture is don't talk about atheist culture. I'm so sorry for that. Oh my god. My mom got me these uh, as a stocking stuffer for Christmas. Thank you, mom. They were a really great stocking stuffer, and I, I can make use of these as I travel this winter. Uh, she didn't mean anything by it. She's, she's never been on Reddit. Come on. She, she didn't know. But yeah, atheists are known to deny the existence of their own culture, even while plenty of very online people associate atheism with very specific cultural expressions, like specific articles of clothing. Still, others frustratedly claim that atheism only kills culture because it's nothing more than a negation of a powerful force for the creation of culture. Theism. So, what's going on here? The answer to that involves a lot of drama. Drama I myself became a target of when I even dared to tweet that atheist culture exists. I was actually genuinely surprised how vicious people became. We'll absolutely get into that, but let's first explore the features of atheist culture. A little about this list, this covers elements of atheist culture in the English-speaking world from the past 30 years or so, particularly in the US, Canada, and UK. There are certainly atheists of other languages and in other parts of the world who share these elements, and those who have distinct cultural elements of their own. Here, I'm just focusing on the culture that I know best. All illustrations were done by the award-winning Canadian cultural commentator and YouTuber, JJ McCullough. He has a nice cadence, doesn't he? JJ also helped me brainstorm and outline this video when he came to visit me a few months ago, so this is basically a full-fledged collab at this point. Thank you, JJ. I hope you found the process as rewarding as our trip to Bucky's. All right, we'll start, of course, with the Four Horsemen. These guys are called the Four Horsemen of Atheism, or New Atheism, by some. Sam Harris could be considered to have kicked off a new era of atheism, or at least atheist literature, with his book The End of Faith, which was a kind of response to 9-11 and the role that religion played in that attack. Sam Harris is a neuroscientist and philosopher. Richard Dawkins wrote what might be the most famous or infamous atheist book of all time, The God Delusion. This book outlines a lot of common ideas and arguments that atheists have against religion, but especially against Christianity. It also contains some language that became a part of atheist identity going forward. We'll revisit that later. Dawkins might be known more so as a polemicist against religion these days, but he's actually a very accomplished and decorated biologist as well. Christopher Hitchens was a journalist and, let's face it, polemicist against religion. He wrote the anti-theist book God is Not Great, which was a diatribe against religion in all forms. The tagline for that book is, Religion Poisons Everything. Daniel Dennett, otherwise known as the Atheist Santa Claus, by me, wrote Breaking the Spell, which advocates for studying religion scientifically. As a cognitive scientist, this is a natural extension of Daniel Dennett's work. The title of The Four Horsemen for these guys comes from a 2007 dialogue where the four of these guys got together and broadcast a discussion they had on what they agreed on and disagreed on when it came to religion and atheism. I'm not much of a fan of these guys myself. Daniel Dennett seems all right from what I know about him today, but I've soured on the others a bit since I first became an atheist, and I don't engage with their work on religion anymore. My point here is I'm not any more or less of a real atheist because I don't enjoy or endorse every feature on this list. In my book, a person's own sense of belonging, basically their self-identification with and acceptance in a culture, is all it takes to be a part of that culture. Culture is the product of those who identify with a group, not a measuring stick by which we decide whether the member of a group is valid. 
I will say, though, I do wonder what Christopher Hitchens would have to say about the destruction of the Satanic Temple's display at the Iowa State Capitol. The display was legally set up, a Christian man destroyed it shortly thereafter, and now he's being charged with a hate crime. In my imagination, Hitch would say something like, Good, now let's meet all other idols which pollute public life with similar contempt. I found this story because I follow the topic religion on my favorite news aggregate app and website, also this video sponsor, Ground News. I really do read the news almost entirely through Ground News at this point because it is the best way to see all related articles in one place, compare coverage, and find high quality sources. Beside every headline, they provide a rating of the source's political bias, how reliable their reporting practices are based on three independent news monitoring organizations, and even who funds the source. Let's look closer at the story I mentioned. On the website, we see almost 50 articles talking about this story, with 85% of the coverage coming from right and center-leaning sources, making this a potential blind spot for left-wing readers. We can also see how coverage differs depending on where it comes from. The left emphasizes that the man was accused of a hate crime, while the right emphasizes that he was a Christian veteran. Note that the sources with this emphasis also have a rating of mixed factuality, telling us that there is some subjectivity and sensationalism in the reporting. I think we can all agree that the more access readers have to tools like these, the better. So, to get ground news, go to ground.news slash skeptic. Subscribe through my link for 30% off unlimited access to the Vantage subscription, the plan I use, making it just $5 a month. Okay, let's continue. On to educators. I've got three examples here, Carl Sagan being the first. He was a scientist and science communicator who didn't call himself an atheist, but he did revolutionize popular science education and secular thought on non-supernaturalist spirituality. I think that's been very impactful in atheist spaces. He could be credited with popularizing the term scientific skepticism, which is often in vogue in atheist communities. It's using the tools of scientific thought in order to scrutinize things inside and outside of the lab. Neil deGrasse Tyson, another guy who does not call himself an atheist, but is very popular and influential in atheist spaces. From education to scientific skepticism to philosophy, I think we could consider Neil deGrasse Tyson the and pardon the phrase here, spiritual successor to Carl Sagan. Bill Nye. Now, Bill Nye does not regularly talk about religion or atheism, but his debate with Ken Ham in 2014 was massively impactful, very much influenced atheist spaces. I personally know almost a dozen people who say that the Bill Nye Ken Ham debate that was had over evolution and creation really influenced their coming out of faith and becoming an atheist. Atheist comedians. George Carlin. Carlin died in 2008, but his legacy is still influential enough today to earn a spot on this list easily. He's a legendary comedian, author, and actor who very often mocked those in power in his work. Politicians and clergy were regular targets of his wit. Among atheists, he might be best known for a particular comedy routine of his, which is floating around on YouTube right now, titled, Religion is Bullshit. I can't even count the number of times I've heard other atheists in real life imitate Carlin's punchline, but he loves you. And the Invisible Man has a special list of ten things he does not want you to do. <laughs> and if you do any of these ten things, he has a special place full of fire and smoke and burning and torture and anguish where he will send you to live and suffer and burn and choke and scream and cry forever and ever till the end of time. But he loves you. <laughs> Ricky Gervais. He's got countless stand-up bits analyzing and mocking the Bible and God and several movies and series revolving around religion and atheism. Think the invention of lying and afterlife. Tim Minchin. He's a stand-up comedian, musician, actor, and director. Atheists know him best from his musical comedy performances where he lampoons alternative medicine and religion. He's kind of like Bo Burnham for Gen X and maybe the oldest of the millennials. Stephen Fry. Fry is a British actor, humorist, and documentary filmmaker, and much more, actually. Among atheists, he's particularly well-known for his work in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, publicly speaking against the Catholic Church, and many media interviews where he discusses the problem of evil. He is not against religion as a whole, but speaks against religious harm very strongly. Atheist Magicians 
The late James Randi was a magician who made a career challenging psychics to prove their powers in controlled environments right up on stage where they always embarrass themselves. This was called the $1 million paranormal challenge, and yeah, of course, no psychic ever actually won because James Randi was able to debunk every single attempt. He was very well known for exposing the tricks of faith healers as well, particularly Peter Popoff. I suspected that Popoff's revelations were other than divine. A radio scanner we brought to the hall picked up a decidedly worldly source. Popoff was being prompted by his wife through a wireless earpiece. Penn Gillette. He is a magician with Penn and Teller. He performs on stage in Las Vegas. I've actually seen the show before. And he at one time had a TV show called Bullshit, where Penn and Teller debunked the paranormal. Penn was known to be an outspoken atheist. He'll talk about that in his various shows and media appearances. He apparently at one time had a pink Mini Cooper with a vanity plate that read atheist. Atheist organizations. The Freedom From Religion Foundation is an organization which seeks to stop religious overreach in public life and protect the separation of church and state. They have an annual conference, which is one of the most attended atheist conferences that's ever existed. Lawyers in this organization often appear in media on CNN, MSNBC, even Fox News to talk about cases that they're involved with. American Atheists. This is the oldest atheist organization in the U.S., founded by Madeleine Murray O'Hare in 1969, I believe. They provide community spaces for atheists in the U.S. and fight legal battles to protect secular life from religious encroachment. A little shout out to their president, Nick Fish, who I've met and think is the right person to be steering such a giant ship for the atheist community. The Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. The committee is a program for the Center for Inquiry, a nonprofit educational organization founded by some recognizable people like Carl Sagan, Isaac Asimov, and James Randi. According to their website, their mission is to promote scientific inquiry, critical investigation, and the use of reason in examining controversial and extraordinary claims. They publish a magazine, Skeptical Inquirer. They host SciCon in Vegas every year, which is a very good time, one of the most fun atheist or skeptic conferences there is, in my opinion, and they contribute to other forms of media. Now on to identities and labels. Anti-theist. This is the position of being against theism or religion in general. Christopher Hitchens is probably the one who popularized this term more than anyone else. I myself used to oppose all forms of religion, and I called myself this, but it's, it's been years since those days. Agnostic Atheism Quadrant Theory. This is a way of defining agnostic and atheism and how those things can overlap. It's very popular in kind of pop atheism. A lot of people might draw from this quadrant and not realize that they're doing so. The top left quadrant is agnostic theist, one that believes that God exists, but doesn't claim to know if God exists. Over to the right, gnostic theist, believes in at least one God, claims to know that gods exist. Bottom left, you've got agnostic atheists, which I contend is the majority of people who consider themselves atheists. They say they lack a belief in God and don't claim to know that God does not exist. And then Gnostic theist lacks belief in gods, claims to know that no gods exist. I have met atheists like that as well. The big takeaway here is that in this sort of theory, belief and knowledge are considered to be two different things. And therefore, since agnosticism has to do with knowledge and atheism, theism has to do with belief, you can be an agnostic atheist, a Gnostic atheist, you know, etc. The Dawkins scale. This comes from Richard Dawkins' The God Delusion, and it's meant to describe the spectrum of theistic belief. Dawkins calls himself a 6.9, and I would say that 6 is probably the most common number that people identify themselves with in the atheist community. Number 1. Strong theist. I do not question the existence of God. I know he exists. 2. De facto theist. I cannot know for certain, but I strongly believe in God. 3. Weak theist. I am very uncertain, but I am inclined to believe in God. 4. Pure agnostic. God's existence and non-existence are exactly equiprobable. 5. Weak atheist. I do not know whether God exists, but I am inclined to be skeptical. 
Six, de facto atheist. I cannot know for certain, but I think God is very improbable. Seven, strong atheist. I am 100% sure there is no God. Maybe not so much these days because that book came out quite a while ago now, but at a certain point in time, atheists would commonly get to know each other by talking about the Dawkins scale. You know, what number are you? Everyone answers six to 6.9. <laughs> okay, not everyone, but everyone I've ever met. Our next few features are common experiences. Coming out stories. Atheism is a minority position basically everywhere, but some places, especially in the US, are rather hostile to atheists. Especially if you have religious family, it's common to hide your atheism until you're ready to face the social consequences. A coming out experience, as you might guess, is where you become open about your atheism for the first time. Some face extremely negative reactions from this, where family stops trusting them, or they even lose their marriage and children. Others don't face any negative consequences at all. It just depends entirely on the individual's situation. Deconversion stories. Becoming an atheist isn't a conversion to a religion, but one away from religion. Thus the term deconversion. Leaving religion, especially if you were raised particularly religious, is one of the most stressful and impactful experiences in life for many people. For that reason, atheists are inclined to talk about that journey. Atheists tend to share their deconversion stories in atheist community spaces as a way to get to know each other. Meeting another person with a similar story is an extremely validating experience and can bond people together very quickly. Sometimes atheists also share these stories because religious people demand to know the story of how they left so they can pass judgment on the validity of the experience or uh, try to understand them, hopefully. Debates. Debating the existence of God and the supernatural, the validity and efficacy of religious practice, and the like is huge in atheist communities. These debates can be formal, held in a venue or an organized online event, or they can be entirely impromptu, like in the comment section of every video I've ever made. Atheists commonly cite watching debates as a part of their deconversion story. They watched as a religious person, but found the other side more compelling. Thus, the change. There's a stereotype out there that atheists constantly want to debate the existence of God, even in extremely inappropriate situations. That is definitely true for some people. Uh, for others, learning to debate well is more of a response to the constant challenge from the religious people around them. I personally don't enjoy debate really at all. I don't watch them, and you guys know I don't engage in them. But I had to cultivate my debate skills just to stand up for myself when the religious people in my life pushed me to do so when I first started doubting religion. On to atheist symbols. The Atheist A. I'm not sure of the origin on this one, but I do have a guess. Please fact check me if this is incorrect. I think it might have been created by a member of Atheist Alliance International around 2000, according to an old web archive I found. But again, if I'm wrong, I, I would like to know that. One thing I am sure about is that the majority of people watching this video have seen the Atheist A at one point or another, whether you realize it or not. The atom, or atomic structure. This is based on Ernest Rutherford's model of the atom. This symbol is used by atheist and scientific skepticism communities. You'll see people who don't necessarily identify themselves as atheists using this symbol as well. I actually use this symbol in my profile picture logo thing, and so does American Atheist. The Flying Spaghetti Monster. This one has quite the story. Okay, in 2005, the Kansas Board of Education amended their science education standards to integrate the teaching of intelligent design via the infamous teach the controversy method. So, as one does, in 2006, Bobby Henderson wrote an open letter to the Kansas School Board advocating that multiple perspectives on intelligent design be taught, including his religious belief in creation via the flying spaghetti monster, his god. Yeah, this took the logic which Christians use to push intelligent design and took it in a ridiculous new direction. They actually created a whole parody religion called the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. 
But as the Constitution does not define what a religion is in the first place, who's to say those touched by his noodly appendage should not be given the same protections as Christians? Again, maybe not as much as it once was, but this little character is still somewhat common to see in atheist spaces, whether as a bumper sticker or t-shirt or whatever. The Darwin Fish. This is a parody of the Jesus Fish. Two men, Al Sakel, I think, and Chris Gilman, both claim to have independently created the Darwin Fish in the 1980s. Since then, in true evolutionary fashion, the Darwin fish has evolved into many different forms. This is another character that's common to see as a bumper sticker. The Dark Lord himself, Satan. While Satan is obviously a Christian figure, he's taken on his own significance in certain atheist spaces. Atheists are ignorantly accused of worshipping Satan often enough that some sarcastically claim they do, along with eating babies and other crazy nonsense. To these atheists, Satan is a tool by which to mock those who unfairly slander them. For some, though, their view of Satan is deeper than that. Thanks to the Romantics, people like Percy Shelley, Lord Byron, etc., Satan is seen as a figure of heroic defiance, of tyrannical authority. He's fictional, but still inspiring. Non-supernaturalist religious groups like the Satanic Temple view Satan this way. I have plenty of videos now about Satanism and Satanic imagery, Satanic literature, that kind of thing, so uh, yeah, check out my playlist. Our next category is Community Spaces. Atheist YouTube. Atheist YouTube is one of the oldest genres on YouTube, if you can believe it. I think it started in 2006, which is the second year YouTube existed. It's gone through several different waves of creators and political attitudes. It's been kind of a radicalizing force for the alt-right sometimes, and like now, it's a force for the progressive left. It was my first community space in the atheist world, and I've met several friends, basically all of my closest friends, through atheist YouTube in one way or another. r slash atheism. Should I put on the fingerless gloves for this one, or...? <laughs> This is a subreddit for people who share their thoughts about religion, their experiences, news involving religion and atheism, etc. This is probably the atheist space with the worst reputation, but I'll talk about that later when we discuss negative stereotypes. Screen names. Atheist spaces are largely online, and being an atheist also carries risk for many people, so anonymity is necessary. Naturally, people will create and often go by their screen names. I've met people at in real life events where we all call each other by our screen names. I know Owen Morgan from Telltale in real life, and I actually called him Telltale for weeks before I got used to using his actual name. I'm sure that sounds really odd from the outside, but there again, when you get named after a certain saint, in your Catholic baptism, or when you're given a new Christian name, or a new Muslim name, or a new Satanist name, yeah, that's an analogous experience, I think, to using and going by your screen name as an atheist. They actually develop importance for us sometimes. Plenty of people I know very well at this point actually called me GM or skeptic for a while when we first got to know each other. Conferences. All the major organizations I covered hold annual events with speeches, panels, book signings, activist workshops, magic shows, and other performances. I've gone as an attendee and as a speaker. Honestly, I do have more fun as a speaker, but yeah, they, they can be a good time. There are several smaller conferences that also happen, but usually on a less regular basis. The big conferences are often expensive, so in my experience, it's mostly older people who attend these things. The big ones, I mean. This is usually where exclusively online communities meet in real life, though, so that strongly incentivizes at least a few young people to attend these. Local groups with meetups. These are usually organized through Facebook, but sometimes through the app Meetup, these are the primary meeting space for atheists in real life, I would say. 
These groups are usually private, but they do use real names. The privacy is often to protect the identities of those who are involved in the community, but can't really be open about their atheism without risking severe social consequence. I've been there. <laughs> usually these meetups consist of going to dinner or playing board games, and sometimes they host talks from, you know, popular people, YouTubers sometimes. I'll include the organization Secular Student Alliance here. This is probably the most um, cohesive and in real life type of atheist community that exists. It still organizes primarily through Facebook and email, but it's rare that you have a group of atheists that see each other so often through this organized official type of group. Of course, it's a college campus that makes this type of density of real life atheists possible. Well, we have reached the point in the video where I talk about politics next, so now is a good time for me to take a quick break from filming. Good Olive Garden soup and salad? I got seconds and I'm gonna put it in a box. Crafty. Just saving money. Not sponsored by Olive Garden in any way. Or also, Olive Garden wants a sponsor. Yeah. I'm saying no. Get at us, Olive Garden. Uh, okay, our waiter's getting the biggest tip. Okay, people like when I do random, meaningless skits in my videos, so let me know if you want me to go to more chain restaurants in the, <laughs> in the middle of my videos for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> okay, our next category is politics. Progressivism, at least in the US. Statistically, atheists are the demographic who are most likely to support progressive political causes like LGBT rights, reproductive rights, expanding social programs, and the like. You may have heard that atheists are usually right-leaning, edgelord, anti-SJW types, but this is statistically false. Some popular atheist figures have accurately been described that way, but most atheists are actually the political opposite. I've had people approach me in real life atheist spaces to literally whisper in my ear that they are right-leaning and an atheist and that they are afraid to say what they think about, I don't know, uh, abortion or something like that. And yeah, while I may very much disagree with their political ideas, I do have sympathy for the fact that conservative atheists are actually kind of politically homeless in a way. They're not accepted that well by atheists and they're not accepted very well by the right because the right typically, in the US at least, does not like atheists. Separation of church and state. The Freedom From Religion Foundation, American Atheists, and several other organizations fight unconstitutional religious overreach and do so with donations from atheist members. Atheists regularly vote for candidates who proudly stand up for this issue, which are usually Democratic candidates. It is very common in atheist community spaces for people to get together and commiserate over their fear and loathing of encroaching Christian nationalism. Science education advocacy, basically teaching evolution in schools. Atheist parents are known to be very vocal supporters of science education in public schools, which usually means opposing proposals to teach religious pseudoscience like intelligent design in classrooms. The Teacher Institute for Evolutionary Science, for example, provides free workshops and materials to public school science teachers to help them teach about evolution. This is funded by the Richard Dawkins Foundation. Slogans and vocabulary. There are a lot of catchy phrases in atheist culture, but I'll just go over a few here. I just go one God further. This expresses the idea that the reason an atheist doubts the existence of all gods is the same reason a religious person doubts the existence of all gods except their own. So an atheist might say to a religious person, you disbelieve in thousands of gods, and I just go one God further. Sky Daddy. Ah, in Abrahamic religions, Christianity especially, God is painted as a father figure who lives in heaven above. This phrase takes that supposedly sacred idea and puts it in more profane, derogatory terms in order to make a point about the silliness of the idea. 
a heavenly father doesn't sound credible when you put it in this way. I have on my channel asked people to stop saying this one, but here's an example of atheist culture not being a monolith. <laughs> We're all born atheists until someone starts lying to us. This expresses the idea that the default state for a human being is disbelief in or lack of awareness of God. People don't believe in gods on their own, this posits. They only start believing when another person feeds them misinformation. This one is somewhat contentious in atheist spaces because a lot of us, myself included, don't think it's fair to say that anyone is born an atheist or to imply that it's inherently dishonest for a believer to tell others about gods. Cue the debate in the comments. Atheist stories and myths. Russell's Teapot. This comes from an unpublished article for Illustrated Magazine authored in 1958 by the great philosopher Bertrand Russell. Many Orthodox people speak as though it were the business of skeptics to disprove received dogmas rather than of dogmatists to prove them. This is, of course, a mistake. If I were to suggest that between the Earth and Mars there is a China teapot revolving around the Sun in an elliptical orbit, Nobody would be able to disprove my assertion, provided I were careful to add that the teapot is too small to be revealed even by our most powerful telescopes. But if I were to go on to say that, since my assertion cannot be disproved, it is intolerable presumption on the part of human reason to doubt it, I should rightly be thought to be talking nonsense. If, however, the existence of such a teapot were affirmed in ancient books, taught as the sacred truth every Sunday and instilled into the minds of children at school, hesitation to believe in its existence would become a mark of eccentricity or entitle the doubter to the attentions of the psychiatrist in the enlightened age or the inquisitor in an earlier time. The point here is that the burden of proof is not on the skeptic to disprove a claim, but on the believer to prove it. This analogy was popularized in more recent years when Richard Dawkins cited it in a few of his works. Life of Brian. This is the title of Monty Python's satire of messianic cults in ancient Judea. It portrays ancient prophets as lunatics and their followers as even crazier than them. It doesn't directly mock or attack Jesus, as the creators actually thought there wasn't much to mock about Jesus, but it rather mocks religious devotees. Of course, it's common for atheists to quote this. I've even included clips of it in recent videos. Also, if you walk around at an atheist conference whistling, uh, look on the bright side of life, people will join in. It's, it's great fun. The Pale Blue Dot. It was Carl Sagan who wrote Pale Blue Dot, A Vision of the Human Future in Space in 1994. This was inspired by Voyager 1's image, Pale Blue Dot, a somewhat unremarkable photo by today's standards, but an inspiring and humbling one back the year I was born. This piece of literature is deeply meaningful, dare I say, spiritually significant for many atheists, myself included. It expresses that humanity is not central to the cosmos and that humility and careful stewardship of our tiny home, Earth, is the only way forward for us. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe, are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Douglas Adams' Puddle Analogy Lucky for me, this bit of Douglas Adams' comedy routine is on video, so I'll just play it here. A puddle wakes up one morning and thinks, this is a very interesting world I find myself in. It fits me very neatly. In fact, it fits me so neatly 
I mean, really precise, isn't it? <laughs> it must have been made to have me in it. This analogy reframes a human-centric perspective, showing us how silly it is to view the Earth or the whole universe as intended for us when, in fact, our environment came first and we are simply a byproduct that adapted to fit our environment. Okay, we've made it to negative stereotypes. The angry atheist. It's probably not news to you that a certain set of theists stereotype atheists as angry and hateful. There's this idea that atheists will go off on you if they find out that you believe in God or will constantly want to scream at you about why you're an idiot or correct you when you haven't really said anything wrong. This kind of thing. The idea is that atheists are just generally angry people even if they don't have a reason to be. Now regarding Reddit, not everyone, but enough users across time have been very aggressive and condescending toward religious people in r slash atheism that the space has a poor reputation. I will say it's very easy to get that reputation as an atheist in America, though. I get called a hateful, cringe Reddit atheist all the time, even though I'm actually a religious pluralist, and I don't insult religious people at all on my channel. I've been called the Mr. Rogers of atheism by Christians in my audience, and I still get called this cringe Reddit atheist because it's a stereotype. Fedora tippers. I'm gonna be real with you. I don't know where this came from, and I didn't really attempt to find out because I value my mental health enough to protect myself from any discourse that uses the term fedora temper. <laughs> There's a certain aesthetic that atheists are stereotyped as having, wearing fingerless gloves, black vests, and most famously, fedoras. Why? I don't know. The insult here, I guess, is that this is a nerdy, cringeworthy style associated with a sense of self-importance and condescension. I have legitimately had people in response videos to me where I was very nice and wore a t-shirt, get a fedora, and go, let me put it in terms you can understand, and tipped it. When have I ever done that? I, I've never even, I don't even own hats. I mean, why would I? New atheism. This term is an exonym, a name given to a group by outsiders. Atheists generally do not call themselves new atheists at all, and they never have. This term was invented by journalist Gary Wolf in an article for Wired magazine in 2006. While it refers to the Four Horsemen and their most outspoken fans, it doesn't do so in a neutral way. The connotation of this term since its invention has always been negative. New atheist does not mean atheists who like such and such book or author. New atheist means arrogant, dogmatic, angry atheist who almost blindly worships Richard Dawkins. Which is so ironic because they supposedly hate anyone who worships anything, am I right? Yeah, I guess I have feelings about this one. I don't say this to suggest that atheist figures or groups do not deserve criticism because they do. But Rather, I say this to make the point that the term new atheist is not just a neutral descriptor. It's a buzzword created to polemicize against one's ideological rivals. Okay, we finished the list. Now, with all the features of atheist culture out there, why do certain atheists deny that atheism has a culture? My explanation is that this is a defensive posture against those who attempt to mock atheists by saying that atheism is a religion or cult. When I tweeted about atheist culture in preparation for this video, the quote tweets were straight up hateful and kind of hilariously pathetic. To these people, my acknowledgement that atheist culture existed was some kind of hostile act that deserved hostility in return. In this environment, I understand why one of my followers tweeted back at me to say that atheists don't share a culture. When certain religious folks refuse to see nuance, like for instance the differences between culture and an abusive cult, 
it becomes preferable to respond to critics without much nuance. Especially offline, atheism is still a very small minority position in the US at least, and identifying as such leaves you open to unprovoked personal attacks from others, with a particularly popular attack being, oh yeah, well if you hate religion so much, then why did you join the religion of atheism? In response, some atheists will overcorrect by not only denying that atheism is a religion, but insisting that atheists have no shared culture at all, that the only thing atheists share is their disbelief in gods. In this previous video, I discussed how the negation of an identity can become an identity in itself, particularly when the identity being negated is very common. That's how not being a theist has become as valid and substantial an identity as being a person of faith. Similarly, given how widespread and influential theistic cultures are, those who decidedly set themselves apart from that culture create fertile ground from which a new and distinct culture may arise. When enough people share an idea, even if that idea is that they don't share another particularly common idea, culture inevitably results. That's not a bad thing. It doesn't indicate that the idea at the culture's root is bad. Neither does it indicate that the idea is good. The fact is that humans are so predisposed to create shared culture that rich cultural landscapes can spring even from what some claim is too infertile of soil. Thanks for watching. I've been Drew of Genetically Modified Skeptic. Thank you to JJ McCullough for helping me so much with this video. I am happy to lend any of my artistic talents to your channel to return the favor. So let me know when you lower your standards enough to let that happen. Of course, a special thanks to my patrons for their constant love and support. If you want to hear more from me, then subscribe. As always, if you are an apostate in need, there are resources linked in the description to help you find community and mental health support. Remember to be kind to others in the comments, and until next time, stay skeptical.